Okay, any questions before we continue? Let's look at this example. Is there an electric field in this thing? There are charges in it, so there are localized electric fields. Of course, they will be pointing in different directions at different points, on the, and nothing comes out, but inside there are electric fields. Okay? So there is an energy stored in the system. It is this one. But I'm not really interested in the energy stored in this one because I'm not intending to break it to take the energy out. But what I am interested in <coughs> is, for example, if when I attach my charger over here, there will be charges flowing in this. Well, we won't be interested in flowing charges. So let's just assume that I, put, I bring some charge and put it over here or some point inside. And then later on, I take that charge away. So there's, when I, I am bringing that charge, there's some work that I had done to bring this additional charge to my system. So I stored some additional energy to my system in addition to this one. And then I can take that energy away later on without breaking my keyboard. Okay, so that is the other kind of energy stored in my system. It is this one over here. Because if I don't bring any charge, if there are no charge here, I didn't really store any additional energy to the system. This is still non-zero although I didn't store any energy, there, there is energy stored here when people were creating this one, when we created this uh, keyboard, we did store some energy in this. But that energy is not the energy I'm going to take away because that will destroy my keyboard. I'm not interested in that energy. I'm interested in the additional energy. And that additional energy is this one over here. And keep in mind that this E over here, whenever I, we are talking about the E, it is the total electric field, not the one that we apply, not, uh, it's the total one. Whatever is creating an electric field, uh, even the bound charges are contributing to that E. So that's the main difference between this energy stored and this energy stored. This energy stored is the energy stored in bringing all the charges including the atoms and the molecules making my keyboard from infinity to their final configuration. This is the energy of the system or the work that I need to do to bring some additional charges to my keyboard without breaking it. My keyboard still stays as my keyboard. I put some charges on my keyboard and then I can take them away later on. That is this work, this energy store. Well, you see, this is already, I'm not really adding them. You see, the, the problem is when I add more charges over here, I'm also modifying the uh, present electric field. Well, this will be deformed. Other questions? Anything you want to reveal? Well, you see, I can see that you are not actually following, at least most of you are not following what I'm telling you. <laughs> but I also don't know what to reveal. Without you asking questions, I, I just continue. So if you ask me questions, that will help me also to review what we are actually doing in the class. Okay, I will. <laughs> so let's see what's the energy stored in a capacitor. Let's use this expression over here, delta W is equal to 1 over 2 e dot d d cubed r. 
to calculate the total energy in a capacitor. <laughs> well, what do we know? This is the capacitor we have, assuming it's almost infinite. Inside we have this dielectric with dielectric constant, let's say epsilon. There is a total charge Q and the area of this plate, let's just call it A. And we also have the surface charge density it would be just Q over A. And the displacement field or the electric field will be just sigma over epsilon. This will be the magnitude of the electric field. The potential difference well, no, I need the displacement field. Remember the displacement field is just epsilon times E and uh, so the magnitude of the displacement field is just sigma. E and D, they are both in the same direction. So E dot D is equal to sigma squared over epsilon. So the energy stored is 1 over 2 sigma squared over epsilon times d cubed r. Sigma squared over epsilon, since it's just a constant within my capacitor, I'm taking it out. What remains is the volume integral. Then this is 1 over 2 sigma squared over epsilon a times h. This is the total energy stored in my capacitor. Let's write it in terms of the total charge. 1 over 2, Q squared over A squared. This is sigma squared. A times H over epsilon. Or let me write it in a, in a slightly different form. Q over A. This is the sigma times sigma. But you see, sigma over epsilon is nothing but the electric field. Q times sigma over epsilon times H. Well, sigma over epsilon is nothing but the electric field. And the potential difference between these two plates is nothing but E times H sigma h over epsilon. So the potential difference is E times h. So the work, the energy stored in my system is just 1 over 2 Q times delta V. Now this is the expression that we already know for the capacitor. We can write it as 1 over 2 C times delta V squared or 1 over 2 delta V no, Q squared over C. Whichever one you like. Now here C is just epsilon R, or let, let us drive it. Delta V is E times H. E is sigma over epsilon times H. Sigma is Q over A times H over epsilon zero. And this is, by definition of the capacitance, just Q over C. So C is equal to epsilon times A over H. This is the capacitance of my capacitor filled with a dielectric completely filled with a dielectric.
It increases if you put a dielectric. Well, you see, it depends on how much dielectric you can put. You see, if you are just putting more and more matter, you cannot avoid increasing H. Epsilon is just a constant for a material. Given the material, epsilon is just a constant. So if you want to increase the capacitance, you should better use a material with a high permittivity, use a large A, and lower your H. So, okay, as H approaches but zero, they, but they shouldn't each other each other. okay, so capacitance diverges. According to this expression, at least. So, is there something wrong with that? You see, the problem is, <coughs> let's look at the capacitance. What happens, what is the difference between a capacitor with a large capacitance and a capacitor with a smaller capacitance? Look, let's look at delta V. This is equal to Q over C. Now, what we are actually matter is the electric field, which is delta V over H. Q over C times H. So, okay, so in, in your example, C diverges, but at least in the expression of the electric field, H goes to zero. This C times H will be a constant. C times H is the, just epsilon times A. So just changing A doesn't really matter. So for a given charge, the larger this product is, CH, or let's say, for a fixed H, for a reasonable value of H, the larger the capacitance is somehow, the smaller the electric field will be. If you have very small capacitance, you, you get a large electric field. Now, the problem with the electric field is we said that, okay, so if you have your material, put it in an electric field, it will polarize the medium, basically uh, pulling the negative and positive charges in different directions. There is a limit of an electric field uh, beyond which there, is what, there will be what we call the uh, electrical breakdown of the material. For example, the thunderstorm, thunderstorm, the lightning. What happens in the lightning is the atmosphere undergoes this electrical breakdown. So the elect electrons are ripped from the atoms. But if the electrons are ripped from the atoms, the electrons are now free to move. If they are free to move, they become a conductor. So there is a limit on the electric field that every material can sustain without going through this electrical breakdown. So for a given material, the larger the capacitance is, if you have a, dielectric, uh, if you have a capacitor with a given dielectric, the larger the capacitance is, the larger charge you can put on the capacitor without reaching this limit of electrical breakdown. That's why we call it the capacity of the capacitor. The larger the capacitance, the larger charge you can put on it without breaking it. The properties of the material. Some materials are easy to go uh, under this electrical breakdown. Some other materials will be more harder. Not really. I mean, for semiconductor, uh, okay, that's a different story. So I, I would rather avoid it. You can ask me after the class. Uh, 
sandwich capacitors. That's exactly what I am solving now. We have this conductor. I have one dielectric, another dielectric, and another, another plate. So this has a dielectric constant epsilon 1. This has a permittivity epsilon 2. Well, I sometimes misuse the terminology. Epsilon, which we defined as epsilon 0, 1 plus psi the uh, permittivity, this is called permittivity. Uh, permittivity. Psi e is the susceptibility. One plus psi e is the dielectric constant. This is what we also call as epsilon r. So these are the permittivities of these two regions, epsilon one and epsilon two. Now, what is the capacitance? For example, this is a problem in which the dielectric constant is not a constant. Well, the, in, in which the permittivity is not a constant. It changes from point to point. If your point is in this region, it has one permittivity. If your point is in this region, it has some other permittivity. <laughs> so let's solve our system. Now, whatever the system is, Row three. This is equal to zero. And since we are talking about linear dielectrics, the displacement field is epsilon times E. Of course, epsilon will have the value epsilon one here. It will have the value epsilon two over here. Well, among these equations, the easiest one to solve is this one. You can just use the gas law if you want because our system has this translational symmetry, etc. So we can use that one. But that already gives me that, uh, you see, this equation is basically the equation for the electric field. I mean, if you apply this equation to this system, we have this translational symmetry that if you put any charge in these plates, they will be uniformly distributed. So we already know the solution of this system. So the displacement field, the magnitude, is just sigma over, it's just sigma, everywhere. This equation doesn't refer to the dielectric, that well, doesn't seem to have any dependence on the dielectric. So the solution of this equation, whether I'm here or here, it will be the same. It is always sigma. Now I can find the electric field though. I have region one, I have region two. So let's say this is my region one, this is my region two. In region one, E is equal to D over epsilon one. So the magnitude of the electric field is equal to sigma over epsilon one. In region two, E is equal to D over epsilon 2. So E magnitude will be equal to sigma over epsilon 2. Now let's assume that the region 1 has a height H1. Region 2 has a height H2. You see, if I want to calculate the capacitance, I need to know the potential difference between these two plates. Now, the potential difference between the plates will be sigma over epsilon 1. This is the electric field in region 1 multiplied by H1 plus sigma over epsilon 2. This is the electric field in region 2 multiplied by H2. This is the potential difference. Or this I can write as Q over A, H1 over epsilon 1 plus H2 over epsilon 2, which should be Q over C. 
Now I know the capacitance. We can calculate, we know the capacitance. Well, we had already evaluated the electric field. So let me write it in a more proper manner. So let's say this is the z axis. This is z is equal to zero, the lower plate. So the electric field, let's just assume this is my positive plate. This is my negative plate. Well, when I'm talking about the capacitance, I didn't really pay attention to the signs because in the definition of the capacitance, everything is positive. The Q is positive, delta V is positive, C is positive. Now let's write the electric field. Well, the electric field is in the Z direction. It always has this sigma factor and it is one over epsilon two if H is between zero, uh, if Z is between zero and H2. If I'm in this region, it is sigma, I mean region two, it is sigma over epsilon two, the electric field. In this region, it is sigma over epsilon one. One over epsilon, sigma is already out there. So if Z is between H2 and H1 plus H2, and it is zero everywhere else. So this is the electric field. Well, we can calculate the polarization. The polarization is Remember, it's epsilon zero times chi times the electric field, chi E, electrical permittivity. Well, I have two different regions which will have two different electric permittivities, electric susceptibilities. So this will be equal to Z in the Z direction times sigma epsilon zero, let's call chi two over epsilon two, if Z is between zero and H2, and epsilon zero, chi one over epsilon two, epsilon one, if Z is between H2 and H1 plus H2. Or let's rewrite this, remember epsilon, epsilon was equal to epsilon zero, one plus the susceptibility, so if I use this, I can just cancel the epsilon zeros. So P, the polarization is equal to in the Z direction, sigma chi two over one plus chi two. If Z is between zero and H two and chi one over one plus chi one. If, well, if I'm in region two. Now what I'm interested in, what I would like to calculate now, is the bound charge at the interface between these dielectrics. So we said that if you have a dielectric, okay, if, you, if you, there's some electric field in the region, either you apply it externally or some charges in your system create this electric field, which is, will be modified by the bound charges. So on the surface, there will be some surface charge density. Now what is the surface charge density? So this is my system. So what is the surface charge density here? Well, we can go through the electric field. That is one possibility. 
Well, let, let's do in various methods. Method one. Over any surface, the electric field outside minus the electric field inside is always equal to sigma over epsilon zero in the normal direction. Normal direction being the direction from inside to outside. So we can use this result. We already know the electric fields. So let's see, N, let's just choose it to be the Z direction. So here we have a surface. Since N is the Z direction, outside is, I'm approaching the surface from larger values of Z Inside means I'm approaching that same surface from the smaller values of set from region two. So E outside is equal to, well, outside is I'm above, that is I'm in region one. The electric field in region one is sigma over epsilon one in the Z direction. The electric field inside is equal to sigma over epsilon two, again in the z direction. E outside minus E inside is equal to sigma times one over epsilon one minus one over epsilon two in the z direction. This is equal to, let me call it, sigma b in the z direction. Because the surface charge density at the interface is due to the bound charges, not the free charges that I put on the, my conducting plates. So this already tells me that this bound charge then, okay, I also have epsilon zero. So my bound charge density is nothing but sigma one over epsilon uh, epsilon zero over epsilon one minus epsilon zero over epsilon two or sigma one over well let, let me just leave it like this epsilon zero epsilon two minus epsilon one divided by epsilon one times epsilon two I could, nothing would have changed. You see, instead of, N, I chose, since you have this surface, you basically have two choices for N. Here, this is my surface, I can choose the normal to be pointing upward, or I could have chosen to be pointing downward. So for N, I could have chosen minus Z. But if I had chosen minus Z, remember this N vector, whichever direction you choose, what you call inside, n vector always starts from what you call inside and goes to what you call outside. So if you choose this as minus z as your n vector, then your inside will be region one and your outside will be region two. But you can do it. So you are changing n, but you are also changing the definitions of inside out. So you get a minus sign here, you get a minus sign over there. Forget the dielectrics. What is D? What's the electric field? Sigma over epsilon zero. What's the D? D is epsilon times the electric field. If there are no dielectrics, epsilon is just epsilon zero. Epsilon zero times sigma over epsilon zero, so D is sigma zero, if there are no dielectrics. Well, the displacement field D doesn't really feel the dielectric. So that's kind of the advantage of using the displacement field. You see, the divergence of the displacement field is determined only by the free charges. 
So the bound charges does not change this equation. So that's why the displacement field was sigma in the absence of the dielectric field. The displacement field is still sigma in the presence of the dielectric field. Mm -hmm. The definition of the capacitor is always you have two conductors, one of them can be at infinity, you put plus Q in one of them and minus Q in the other one. That is the, how you define a capacitor. If you don't def have it such a system, if you put plus Q in one of them, minus 2Q in the other one, then you don't have a capacitor. Uh, can you put some charges on these wires? Plus Q, minus Q. Will that create a potential difference? Well, that's a capacitor, by definition. You are a capacitor without any other wire. I can put some charge on you. And the other plate, the other conductor is at infinity. That makes a capacitor. Do you have a cat? Do you play with cats? Sometimes, okay. So the cat, it just rubs itself on you. He gets static electric electricity, you get static electricity. The cat plus you is a capacitor. <laughs> if you have plus Q charge, the cat has minus Q charge. There's a potential difference between you, so there's a capacitance. Of course, as the cat moves around, the capacitance will change, but nevertheless, if it's stationary, if you are stationary, that's a stationary capacitor. Anything, any, anything that can hold charge, any two things that can hold charge, is a capacitor. It, either you or the plate is charged. One of you are discharged. So when you are approaching him, when you, your finger is approaching the plate, the electric field increases. Since the electric field increases, there will come a point where when the atmosphere will uh, undergo an electrical breakdown. That's when you see that spark. Or when you are putting on your wool shorts in the dark, so you will hear all these uh, ticking sounds. If you do it in dark, you will see little sparks in your sweater or pullover, whatever. There's a large potential difference, creates a large electric field, which creates this electrical breakdown. Now let's come back to this problem. Let's look at this factor over here. So first of all, what happens if epsilon 1 is equal to epsilon 2? The charge is still that there will be 0 and 2 will be counted as There won't be bound, charge, bound surface charge density, as you say. Why? Well, if epsilon 1 is equal to epsilon 2, we don't really have two dielectrics. We have a single dielectric. In a uniform electric field, external in a uniform electric field, the electric field will be uniform. The polarization is uniform. The divergence of the polarization is zero, and the divergence of the polarization corresponds to the charge density. So there is no charge accumulated. And microscop micro microscopically, as you said, <laughs> both of these mediums, I, mean, I can treat each one of them as a collection of dipoles. The dipoles. Since I have negative charges over there, positive charges on the lower plate, so here I will have a, a dipole in my region two. This will be the negative side. This will be the positive side here. This will be the negative. This will be the positive side. So on the surface of this dielectric epsilon two, I will have these all the dipoles. The, the positive ends of the dipoles will align. So on the surface of 
this uh, region two, I get positive charges on the surface of region one. I get the negative ends of my dipoles aligned. So I will get a negative charge and the sum, since they are equal, the sum will be zero. On the other hand, if epsilon two is larger than epsilon one, that means this region will be polarized more. You see the susceptibility will be larger. Epsilon is uh, epsilon zero times one plus the susceptibility. So the susceptibility of region two will be larger. So it will have more dipoles or for a given dipole, the positive end will be more positive than the positive end of a dipole in region one, which has a smaller susceptibility. So I will have more positive charges on the surface of region two than negative charges on this surface of epsilon region one. So if epsilon two is larger than epsilon one, on this interface, I should have a positive bound charge. Well, let's see if this, that is the result we have. Yes, if epsilon two is larger than epsilon one, sigma b is positive. The surface bound charge is positive. And again, we are done. So at least our result uh, coincides with what we expected. Let's go for our method two. So let us assume that the sigma b is sigma 1b plus sigma 2b. Sigma 1 and sigma 2 is, sigma 1 is the surface charge density of, this, of the dielectric 1, and sigma 2 is the surface charge density of dielectric 2. So at this interface, the total surface charge density will be the sum. And remember, sigma b, let me say i, will be equal to p dot n. Let me also put the, uh, this i over there. Now, in this case, n points from my dielectric to outside. So I have the surface. So the, there is no ambiguity in the choice of this n. It always points from the, my dielectric to the outside. So sigma b1. Let's calculate that one. First of all, I need the, polar, the polarization in my region one, which we had already calculated. You see here in region one is this one, this is region one. This is region two. So polariza, pol, no, the polarizability is over here. Epsilon zero chi one sigma over epsilon one in the z direction. This is my region one. This I have to multiply by sigma in the z direction. Now, the normal vector in region one, you see this normal vector points from my dielectric. It's perpendicular to the surface, but it it points from the inside of my dielectric to the outside. I'm in region one. So the, this n is nothing but in the minus z hat direction. So sigma b one, this will be equal to p that z hat, which is minus epsilon zero over epsilon one multiplied with chi one. Now let's go to sigma b2. In region two, the polarization will be sigma times epsilon zero chi one over epsilon two in the z direction. N hat two, it points from inside my region two, which is this region, to outside, so it's in the plus z direction. So sigma b2, 
which is p, sorry, this is minus z, p dot in the z hat direction, which is epsilon 0 chi 1 over epsilon 2. Sigma b, which is the sum of these two, which is epsilon 0 chi 1 over epsilon 2 minus epsilon 0. Sorry, this is I have chi 1, here I have chi 2. Chi 2 over epsilon 2. So sigma times epsilon 0, chi 1 minus chi 2 divided by epsilon. No. And remember, chi 1 is actually epsilon 1 minus 1 minus chi 2 is epsilon 2 minus 1. and also I have 1 over epsilon 0. Here I'm basically using the definition that epsilon is equal to epsilon 0, 1 plus chi, or chi is equal to 1 minus epsilon over epsilon 0. So let me rewrite this in a proper way. So epsilon 0 chi 1, epsilon 0 chi is equal to epsilon minus epsilon 0. That's what I will be using. Epsilon minus epsilon 0 over epsilon 1 minus epsilon minus ep epsilon 2 minus epsilon 0 over epsilon 2. You see here I have a 1, epsilon 1 over epsilon 1. Here I have a minus 1 epsilon 2 over epsilon 2. They will cancel. So this term cancels this one. So I end up having sigma times epsilon 0, 1 over epsilon 2 minus 1 over epsilon 1. This is equal to sigma epsilon 0, epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 divided by epsilon 1 times epsilon 2. Okay, now I have a sign mistake somewhere. Let's see, epsilon is equal to epsilon 0 plus epsilon 0 chi, so epsilon 0 chi is equal to epsilon, epsilon minus epsilon 0. So there's no sign mistake. No, that is, well, you see, this is what I have. I multiply it up, so I get epsilon 0 plus epsilon 0 chi. No, hold on. Epsilon over epsilon 0 is 1 plus chi. I'm not using this one. I never use that. Hmm? 
So let's see. N hat in region one, N hat is minus Z. In region two, N hat is, so in region one, N hat is minus Z, so the surface charge density of region one is negative. Is that, does that make sense? <coughs> well, you see, if you consider region one, so this will be positive, this, will, uh, this is a dipole in region one, positive side will be towards the negative plate, negative side will be towards the my surface, so the surface charge density of region one should be negative, and it is negative. So there's no problem here. So sigma B1 is negative. So this is minus, this is positive. So here I have an overall minus sign. Here I have an overall minus sign. So that makes epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1. Yes. Well, there's one more, more way to calculate it. You see, we said in, in both of these approaches, right, in, the, in the second approach, in the first approach, we had this electric field. We didn't use the polarization, etc. In the second approach, we used the polarization, but we assumed that we have two different dielectrics with constant permittivities. So this was just a sum of the surface charge densities of these two. But we could also have said that this whole block is a single dielectric with non-constant permittivity. And so this line over here is not the surface of my dielectric, but in my med inside the volume of my medium. So we, we should be able to talk about the bulk charge density. In, in rho b, which is minus the divergence of the polarization. So we should be able to obtain the same surface charge density using this approach. Well, it will be part of your homework. You see p, this polarization is discontinuous. So it is constant in region one and region two, so the divergence in region one and region two, they are both zero, but at the interface, P is not continuous, so since it's, it has a jump, its derivative at that interface has a Dirac delta function. So this, should, this will be equal to sigma B times this Dirac delta of Z minus H2. Well, this Dirac delta just converts your surface charge density into the volume charge density. You are left with finding the sigma b. You, you will show in your homework. At least this will be one of the problems in your homework. So you see, there is a given problem you have many ways of approaching exactly the same problem. So this, is, this will be basically what we will be doing in all the problems. A given system, there will be many ways of approaching it. Each method will be teaching you something different. Which one to use, it's up to you. You can just choose whichever one you want. There is no single method of solving a given problem. Okay, any last questions before leaving? So, see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>